Hi. Um, so um, I've written this paper as a sort of introduction to uh, medieval Irish studies and textual editing because I assume that most of you are not familiar with our field. Uh, so apologies to the three of you over there who know what I'm talking about. Um, and um, I also, uh, so this is what I'm going to be talking about. And so part of um, what I'll be presenting is based on my PhD thesis. Um, so we're fortunate to have quite a lot of digital resources in the field of medieval Irish studies. These include the Dictionary of the Irish Language, EDIL, uh, bibliographical databases like BILL and Codex, and a IIIF enabled repository of Irish manuscripts, uh, Irish script on screen. There are also several databases of digitized versions of printed editions and translations, for example, Celt and Irish Sagas Online, which are both based in UCC, uh, and various other resources, which I don't have time to list here. The rare digital editions of medieval Irish texts currently available focus mainly on glosses uh, and fragmentary material, as you can see on this slide. So uh, mainly uh, Irish glosses on uh, very old Latin texts and, and grammars. Um, although it is worth noting that uh, resources such as the Early Irish Glossaries database have made available entire compilations of uh, glossaries which often contain uh, short narrative sections and thus shed much light uh, on other medieval Irish texts. Despite all of this, however, medieval Irish narrative texts have thus far not been subjected to digital editorial methods. The issues surrounding digital tools and resources in our field were the main focus of the 2020 to 2021 network developing a digital framework for the medieval Gaelic world, which connected researchers in medieval Irish and Gaelic, and for which I was uh, uh, sorry, a research assistant. So in our report, we noted that the workshops organized were praised by participants and attendees alike for creating the space to discuss important issues in the field of medieval Irish studies and starting to propose ways of moving forward. However, it was stressed that these conversations need to continue in order to affect real change and progress. Everyone agreed that a consensus on digital textual markup and editing practices was a serious desideration moving forward. However, the field of medieval Irish and Gaelic studies is extremely small, and though the digital resources that I've just shown you um, were often pioneers and remain extremely useful, issues of sustainability have been raised repeatedly. What happens to a project once its main driving force changes university or retires? Everyone's reliance on the electronic dictionary of the Irish language, EDIL, is most obvious when the website goes down on the day of the seminar and the only people who show up to the seminar with decent translations are the ones who own a very old copy of the paper dictionary. Now, while this makes for funny anecdotes, it does highlight a huge issue in our field. There is little money, few people, even fewer people with permanent jobs, and fewer still who are capable of maintaining the technical side of such websites. There are two other issues which I think tie into this problem of digital sustainability. The first is that, well, many scholars of medieval Irish do not trust digital resources, which they find unre unreliable. And really, can you blame them when the dictionary goes down several times a month? And the second is the issue of textual editing. So the field of medieval Irish studies is anchored in studies focused on the original text. Despite people like uh, Oko writing in 1974 that the original is always lost and as the concept serves no useful purpose and is theoretically unsound, it will ultimately have to be abandoned. Mm -hmm. While other fields of medieval studies have long recognized that each act of copying was to a large extent an act of recomposition, thus bringing the focus to the manuscripts themselves and allowing for new research questions to be asked, there is a lack of engagement with the theory of textual editing in medieval Irish studies and few people have addressed the difficulties of editing old, middle and early modern Irish texts. As you can see on this slide, this is basically the only things that have been written on this in the past 30 years. 
Thus, many editors still present reconstructed medieval Irish texts, albeit often followed by diplomatic transcriptions and appendices or notes. The field of medieval Irish studies is therefore still preoccupied with the concept of the original text, and when discussing materials such as Agal of Nashanora, my case study today, today and to which I will just come in a minute, um, some scholars continue to look for a version which, and I quote, most faithfully represents the original text of the Aglev. So despite the rise of digital resources in recent years, it's telling that no significant medieval Irish narrative texts have been edited digitally. The primacy of paper and printed edition in our fields continues, and although most of us rely heavily on Celt and archive.r to access texts, these are just digitized versions of printed texts rather than kind of born digital uh, editions. And I think this is perhaps one of the reasons why there's been less engagement with medieval Irish texts as fluid and changing narratives and texts because the paper format does not allow for this fluidity to be represented in a satisfactory fashion. So I'm now gonna to turn to my case study to illustrate all of these points, I hope. So what is Agloth Nationala? Um, the arguably the best text ever. Um, so commonly translated as the colloquy of the, or the dialogue of the ancients, uh, it's based on the premise that the ancient warriors Quilche and O'Sheen, who used to be part of the warrior band of the legendary hero Finn McCool, uh, have survived for hundreds of years down to the time of St. Patrick in the fifth century. Patrick meets them, baptizes them, just to make sure, and they proceed to take him on a tour of Ireland, telling him old stories about how all the places got their names. Now, though the Agalov has been dated to the early 13th century through analysis of its socio-political subtext, it only survive, survives in five manuscripts dating to the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries. Now, the A20 manuscript that you see at the bottom of the slide here is a copy of the uh, perhaps 15th or 16th century uh, A4 manuscript, so we often leave it out uh, when we discuss the, the manuscripts. The text is incomplete in all manuscript witnesses. The Laud manuscript is missing a huge amount at the beginning of the narrative. The Rawlinson version abbreviates the text considerably. A4 is known for additions and rearrangement of tales. And Liz Moore has many, many gaps and is badly damaged in some instances. Furthermore, no manuscript preserves the ending. So these well-known assessments have been made uh, with the help of the existing edition of the text published by Whitley Stokes in 1900, which switches from one manuscript to another without justification, <laughs> introducing variants into the main text or adding them as endnotes, again, without justification, and generally not being thorough in recording all the variants in manuscripts. Another edition by Standish Grady was published earlier than that, uh, but it's only based on the Liz Moore version and does not take into account the other manuscripts. Scholars nowadays generally use Stokes's edition, but obviously a new edition is des desperately needed. As for a translation of the text, O'Grady and Stokes included some translations of part of the narrative in their publications, but it wasn't until 1999 that Anne, Julie, and Harry Rowe finally gave us a full translation of the text. Though it's been extremely useful, um, both for teaching the Agalov and for scholarly use, this translation is not based on either Stokes or O'Grady's editions and uses the different manuscripts interchangeably without giving you the source. As such, the translation is not accurate and cannot be relied on for precise scholarly analysis of the Agalov. In order to discuss the Agalov thoroughly, one has to go to the manuscripts themselves, transcribe the text, translate it, and this requires specialist skills that people who want to discuss or analyze the Agalev do not necessarily have. Nevertheless, the Agalev should not be left out. It's extremely important and complex for many reasons. It's an innovative and creative frame narrative which would benefit from comparison with other contemporary medieval European frame narratives, such as the Canterbury Tales, as well as with the French interlacing narrative techniques. It's a literary witness to 12th and 13th century socio-political developments at the time of the 12th century church reform and in the wake of the Anglo-Norman invasion of Ireland. It has a huge amount of intertextual links 
with other medieval Irish sources, which it uses and rewrites to fit this new context, um, and hence it forms part of a just massive web of textual connections between Irish writings in every genre. It also bears witness to the rise of Finnacht, stories about Finn McCool and his warrior band, which continued to rise in popularity throughout the medieval and into the modern era, both in written and oral form, and the Agla preserved stories that are unattested elsewhere. And finally, it's also important because of place names to which I will come back. Now, when I submitted my abstract, Dr. Kevin Murray had not yet received funding for his fantastic project, which aims to uh, edit the Agalif. So I was originally going to argue uh, that a digital edition of the Agalif is desperately needed. It's now changed to Kevin's project is amazing, and I support it wholeheartedly. <laughs> um, nevertheless, we can still discuss what an edition of the Agalif might look like. So it was recently observed by Kevin, since the theme here, um, that making available, and I quote, making available semi-diplomatic editions of the four primary manuscript witnesses is the most important first step before the creation of any multi-witness critical edition of the Agalove might be attempted. Such work is comparable to the Norman Blake editions of the Canterbury Tales, which was done a while ago. But uh, again, we're a small field. And so, as I just said, all versions of the Agla have break off and finished, all manuscripts have gaps at different stages of, of the narrative, and some versions place sections in a different order. Uh, so the, really the question of the layout of an edition of the Agla is like to briefly focus on the tagging of personal and place names with TI, uh, using my work on the Mapping the Medieval Mind project, which is based in Cambridge, um, in which I've been tagging names in the Denhamus Aden, so the history of the notable places of Ireland, um, a medieval Irish corpus of texts about the origin of place names, which is related to the Agloth. Um, so as you can see on this slide, this is a huge corpus, which consists of compilations of, um, kind of short texts that we've been calling articles, usually in prose and poetry, and which are concerned with how places in Ireland got their names. In this way, it's similar to the Agalov, uh, which is also full of stories about how places got their names, but unlike the Agalov, it's not organized as a frame narrative, as the different articles follow each other and usually do not have any explicit links be made between them, though they are uh, linked sometimes geographically or by subject matter. So I've been working with this project for the past couple of years, and we're just now getting to a point where we start to devise a good kind of enough policy for tagging place names and personal names using TEI. Um, and I just think it shows how such textual markup can make us think more about our material, um, and it applies to the Agolf too. So the first obvious thing is that tagging names makes you reflect on what constitutes a name, in medieval Irish texts. When does a place name acquire place name qualities? Many place names in medieval Irish texts are formed using a common noun and a person's name. So at which point does Alba's Fort refer not to the person called Alba's Fort, but the place? This has to be a judgment call when there's no other evidence of such name, but with searchable and tagged texts, we can at least be certain of which names are extant where and how many times they're mentioned. This reflection on the formation of a place name can also be taken further if the Agalov and the Dunkenhas are being tagged following the same guidelines. The sheer breadth of the Dunkenhas corpus makes it difficult for anyone to do an accurate survey of names, but with markup, we can begin to have a more accurate, extensive list which could be applied and compared with personal and place names in the Agalov, and finally have the data to answer many long-standing research questions, such as, are place names formed in the same ways in both the Agalov and the Genhenas? Which place and personal names do they have in common? Where are they? Which nouns are more commonly used to form place names, and is this the same in the Agalov and the Genhenas? These are all questions that I've been asking myself while tagging Dinkenha's texts, but nobody's been able to answer these yet because the texts have not been edited or marked up in full, and the situation is the same for the Agalov. So this kind of markup would thus facilitate new research into the role that place names play within the Agalov and the Dinkenha's alike, and of course also research in onomastics and history. In turn, I'm certain that marking up the Agalov with personal and place names 
would lead to more clarity as to both the structure of the, the narrative and our understanding of its inner workings. Indeed, the process of tagging names in the Jinhin has, has given me much food for thought on the role that such place names, such names in general, played in medieval Irish texts um, as they serve uh, to create, develop, and change stories. They're often structural, yet malleable and interchangeable if the compiler needed them to be. Tagging personal and place names in the Agro would just thus enhance the searchability of the searchability of the text significantly and a consensus between both projects would also ensure a high degree of interoper interoperability by making the market policies, code and data open access and free to reuse. This work may obviously then be used by linguists, historians and other researchers for further textual tagging and ensure the work's longevity. Sorry, I'm just going a tiny bit over time here. So I've tried to give a broad introduction to the field of medieval Irish textual editing and the issues that we're facing with DH and textual editing. So this is also a call for other disciplines of medieval DH not to forget about us, please. Um, by showing you the complexities, the complexities of the Aglev as a text, I've touched upon most of the difficulties that one encounters when editing medieval Irish narratives in general. The plurality of manuscripts, different versions with variants ranging from different adjectives or, ten or tenses all the way to um, added episodes and completely rewritten sections, complicated textual structure, links to other existing texts, priority of people and places mentioned, and much more. However, the advances in digital scholarship in medieval Irish studies in recent years show that it's now time to turn to complex narrative texts. And I support the Disappearing Text Project in UCC in arguing that the Aglub is the perfect text for the first digital edition of a medieval Irish narrative. The new bespoke software may be used to this end as uh, promised by the Disappearing Text Project. I would argue that existing technologies such as TEI may also be relied on for inter interoperability and sustainability purposes. Producing a digital edition of the Aglub using both new and existing digital and edu editorial practices is an opportunity to make available one of the most important medieval Irish narratives extant and to set general standards of digital editing apl applicable to a wide range of other texts. This will then, hopefully, pave the way for other digital editions of medieval Irish narratives. Thank you.